Okay, so while everybody's kind of getting finally situated, um, I'd like to introduce our first team talk. Um, it's, uh, the title of it is Using Single Nucleus RNA-Seq to Reveal Cellular Diversity in the Adult Human Cerebral Cortex. Uh, this is a cross-departmental team, and it's describing one of our newest pipelines to isolate single nuclei and to use them to understand the, how gene expression differs uh, between different human cortical neurons. Um, as you'll hear, it's a strong collaboration between experimentalists and analysis experts. And representing the team is Rebecca Hodge, Trig Vibakan, uh, Jenny Close, and Boaz Levi. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, so thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to start off our talk today by telling you about how we have uh, developed and scaled up a method to reliably conduct single nucleus RNA-seq uh, in adult human cortex. Uh, and then I'm going to turn things over to Trigva, who's going to tell you about the work that's been done to cluster the single nucleus RNA-seq data and be able to identify cell types using this data. So Jenny is then going to tell you about um, how we are working on using single molecule fluorescent in situ hybridization to validate these transcriptomic cell types uh, and put the cell types in spatial context within human tissue sections. And finally, uh, Boaz is going to tell you about how we're using some of the marker genes uh, that are being revealed by this single nucleus RNA-seq data to develop uh, targeted genetic tools for use in human tissue. So as Christoph outlined for you earlier, uh, the Allen Institute has embarked on a large-scale effort to understand cell type diversity in both the mouse and human brain, uh, with the ultimate goal of understanding the cellular architecture of the functional neocortical column and comparing cell type diversity across species. So one of the tools that we've um, decided to use to address this problem is single cell transcriptomics. Uh, and the, really the beauty of this technique is that we can obtain large amounts of data um, at high throughput uh, using currently available techniques, um, and this will allow us to produce a large-scale provisional characterization of cell types that we can then use this provisional characterization of cell types to drive a lot of other research. So for example, we can generate uh, minimal molecular classifiers from this data, which we can then take, like I said, um, as Jenny will tell you, and use this to understand where these cells spatially fall within tissue. Um, we can also, as Boaz will tell you, create targeted genetic tools from this data. So I'm sure many of you are wondering why we're using nuclei rather than a whole cell. Um, and that's a good question. Uh, and when I started working on this project several years ago, we spent a lot of time and effort trying to uh, be able to successfully dissociate live neurons from human tissue. Uh, and this is working with live neurosurgical resected tissue. Um, and I would say we got pretty good at this. So you can see from the example shown that we are, were able to dissociate out whole neurons. However, what we found um, was that there were several challenges with this. So first, in, in human tissue, we lack Cree lines, obviously, that you have available in mice. Uh, we also lack a really good cell surface marker for enriching for neurons, which are the cell types that we're most interested in. And so we had to basically uh, fact sort these cells based off of just viability. Mm -hmm. And what we found when we did that is that uh, we very poorly recovered our cells that we're most interested in, so neurons. Uh, and those are shown here in the blue and green bars, and we instead recovered a lot of glial cells, and particularly oligodendrocytes. Uh, we have a number of other lines of evidence that also suggest that uh, we're likely getting a biased recovery of neurons using this technique, so a lot of neurons die during the process of dissociation. Um, and this is less than ideal when we're trying to present sort of a comprehensive survey of cell types uh, in the adult cortex. So luckily for us, while we were um, just getting this project up and running, uh, a paper came out from Roger Laskin's lab at the J. Craig Venter Institute where they demonstrated the feasibility of just using a, a nucleus to do RNA sequencing. And so this opened up a lot of um, opportunity for us to apply this technique to our work. Uh, and nuclei have some advantages over whole cells for our, for our purposes, um, one of which is that we can specifically label nuclei with dyes, such as DAPI, um, which are very easy to use. We can also label nuclei with uh, neuronal markers such as NUN, just using simple antibody staining, and then use that to sort the nuclei. Um, we've also found that nuclei isolation is less biased than whole cell recovery. So this is a facts plot showing NUN positive versus NUN negative nuclei. Uh, and what you can see is that we see roughly 50% NUN positive versus 50% NUN negative uh, in this facts plot, which is roughly what we would expect in human tissue, human cortical tissue. The other really major advantage for us using this technique is that it opens up the opportunity for us to use um, banked whole brain postmortem specimens. 
So these are frozen brain uh, specimens. And the, the great part about being able to use these specimens is that this allows us to potentially access any area of the human brain. Whereas with neurosurgical tissue, we're limited to tissue that we receive from resections, uh, that typically, come, typically comes from a limited number of regions. In this way, we can target areas that we'd never see in those resections. But of course, the, the big question about using nuclei is now we're working with a subcellular, very small amount of RNA. And is there enough RNA content there to actually facilitate cell, to facilitate cell type identification? Uh, and Trigville will get into the details of how we've been able to work with this uh, really small amount of RNA and actually make sense of the data that comes from this. So when thinking about how to develop a technique using these whole brain postmortem specimens, we had a couple of considerations in mind. Um, one was that we wanted to be able to develop a technique that would allow us to visualize the lamination of the cortex. And so then we can go in and dissect out regions of interest, layers of interest, and enrich for certain kinds of neurons. And the other major uh, consideration for using this kind of method is that we need to be able to maintain the RNA quality throughout the process. So the way that we did this uh, is that when whole brain postmortem specimens are received at the institute, they're slabbed into one centimeter slabs uh, and frozen and stored at minus 80 until use. We can then go into these frozen slabs and remove a region of interest just by blocking that out of the frozen slab. We then take that region of interest, thaw it in a buffer that's designed to inhibit RNAs, um, to preserve RNA quality. And then we can stain that with a fluorescent nissle stain and visualize all the layers of the cortex. We can then go in and dissect out specific layers. And once you have that dissected tissue, the process of, of isolating and sorting the nuclei is actually very straightforward. Um, and this uh, was developed in collaboration with Roger Laskin's group at the Venter Institute. So basically what you do is you just take your tissue and you dounce homogenize it. That liberates the nuclei while lysing the rest of the cell. And we can then go in and stain, for example, shown here with DAPI and UN, um, and use uh, facts to enrich for certain populations. After that point, we use standard uh, methods for uh, lysis and cDNA and sequencing library preparations, such as, for example, SmartSeq2. So prior to embarking on a, a really large-scale internal project, uh, we wanted to do a sort of smaller testbed study to understand whether or not the data that we got from just single nuclei was going to be sufficient to classify cell types. Uh, so we did this in collaboration with the Venture Institute and with Illumina. Uh, we decided to focus on two sort of testbed regions where we had some pre-existing knowledge of what to expect uh, in terms of cell type diversity in those areas. So we focused on layer five of the frontoinsular cortex, and in layer five we expect to encounter um, a large variety of excitatory neuron diversity, including, for example, these von Economo neurons that you may have heard of uh, that are a human-enriched type of neuron. Uh, we also focused on layer one of middle temporal gyrus, and in layer one, we expect to see a large diversity of interneurons. And I won't go into too much of the details of how the analysis part of this was done, because uh, Trigwell will cover that very shortly. But suffice it to say, from the violin plot that's shown here, um, we were able to discriminate between uh, broad classes of neurons and non-neuronal cells, um, as well as between subtypes of those. And you can see a large diversity, for example, of GABAergic uh, interneuron types shown here. So this result uh, was sufficient for us to decide that we were going to choose this method to go forward and do larger scale uh, project. So sort of simultaneously, uh, while we were developing these methods to do single nucleus RNA sequencing, a really large group of uh, internal Allen Institute collaborators were working very hard to develop um, an RNA-seq pipeline. Um, and this began in the spring of 2015 with a, a methods comparison experiment. Uh, that we conducted that ultimately led to us adopting the SmartSeq or Smarter version 4 uh, clone tech Takara product for uh, scale up in the RNA-seq core. Uh, since that time, we've generated a number of large data sets that uh, you may have seen uh, mostly from mouse whole cells. And in March of 2016, we also started production of human nuclei through the core. Um, since that time, uh, the core, which is managed by Kim Smith, uh, has been working very hard to get us up to a capacity of roughly 35,000 cells uh, and nuclei per year. And so the development of this uh, internal RNA-seq core really led us to be able to then go forward with a large-scale human um, RNA-seq project. Uh, and we started that this year, and we're starting out focusing on middle temporal gyrus, which is the region outlined here in this frozen uh, human brain slab. And this is the region that we most commonly encounter in neurosurgical resections. Um, mostly for uh, epilepsy resections. Uh, it's a region that then we can 
take the data from single nucleus RNA sequencing and pair that with electrophysiological and morphological data that we can generate using these live brain slices that were mentioned. Uh, our target goal is to sequence 15,000 nuclei across all layers of middle temporal gyrus uh, in accordance with the cell density in these various layers. And this year we've uh, collected more than 10,000 human nuclei and are targeting completion of roughly 9,600 um, sequencing libraries by the end of the year. Um, so I'm now going to turn things over to Trigva, who's going to tell you about all the work that's been done to be able to cluster uh, the single nucleus uh, RNA-seq data and <clears throat> characterize cell types. And he's also going to discuss uh, initial analysis of roughly 3,500 single nuclei uh, from this middle temporal gyrus data set. Hey, uh, thanks. So as Rebecca has just shown you, we're able to isolate single nuclei from human brain. Uh, and profile the gene expression of those single nuclei. But the question remains, how well can we discriminate types based on their transcriptomic profile as compared to what we might expect from whole cell data? And so uh, work here and at, in another, uh, many other groups or several other groups have shown using whole cell data from isolated from mouse cortex that we can really see a broad diversity of cell types. And so we designed a targeted experiment uh, where we were able to isolate both whole cells and nuclei in the mouse cortex. Um, to really compare the transcriptome of these two sets of samples and really tell how well we can discriminate types. So in particular, we focused on layer five of primary visual cortex where we know there are a diversity of neuronal types. Um, we isolated 470 new N positive nuclei that passed QC and then selected from uh, whole cells dissected from that same layer that best match those nuclei based on their gene expression profile. We found a good match to most of these nuclei. The majority of correlations um, across all genes were above 0.6. And these whole cells uh, came from a number of transgenic lines, um, which were enriching for different subsets of cells in that layer. So the most striking difference, initial difference that we saw between nuclei and whole cells uh, was the greatly increased number of RNA sequencing reads that mapped to the human genome, the reference genome, uh, but didn't map to known transcripts. And at, with a closer look, we saw that these reads were in fact mapping to introns and not in between genes. And so perhaps represented either novel transcripts unannotated in the transcriptome or partially uh, processed transcripts with retained introns. Um, and in particular, um, including these intronic reads in our analysis, we found that we were able to detect a larger number of genes in the nuclei. Um, and this was also true for whole cells, but more dramatic for nuclei. Even still, including all reads, we did find more genes detected in the whole cells, which might be expected given that you're also capturing the cytoplasm. However, um, in comparing differential expression between nuclei and whole cells, um, this is now including uh, you know, the full set of 470 whole cells in nuclei, we found the majority of genes actually so show similar detection in both nuclei and whole cells, including many of the markers of different cortical cell types in mouse. Um, however, there are some differences, clearly. Um, in particular, in the nucleus, uh, I'm showing these, again, these violin plots, which you can think of as just a distribution of expression values tipped on its side and reflected on the vertical axis. And in red, I'm showing the expression distribution for nuclei and blue for whole cells. And you can see transcripts uh, related to RNA splicing are have increased expression in the nucleus, as well as calcium channel, various calcium channel subunits. In whole cells, we see enrichment for genes involved in the RNA translation machinery and also mitochondrial genes. But really, the, the question we were after is how well can we discriminate different uh, cell, cl cell clusters uh, based on their gene expression profile? And so this, this work really built on uh, clustering work done here by Jijen Yao and uh, Vilas Menon, as well as other groups in the field. Um, and it was really an iterative clustering approach. So very briefly, I'll walk you through that. And the, the strategy was to select genes that were uh, significantly variable across all of the nuclei, to then reduce the dimensionality of those genes using both PCA and TSNE, to then cluster nuclei based on similar gene expression profiles, and then to repeat this process on each of the subclusters until no further splitting was evident. In order to assess the, the robustness of these, these clusters, 
I repeated this procedure 100 times with different subsets of the data, 80% of the nuclei each time. And that resulted in this matrix you see in the middle, um, which shows nuclei in rows and columns. And the color indicates how often each pair of nuclei clustered together across those 100 runs. And so in particular, you can see these red boxes along the diagonal. And these indicate sets of nuclei that, that robustly clustered together and were well separated from other nuclei. As a final step, uh, we defined a, a putative set of transcriptomic cell types um, based on cutting these different boxes into separate bins and then merging any clusters that didn't have uh, at least one gene that showed binary expression labeling that type. So I, I applied the exact same procedure that I just described to both the nuclear and whole cell data independently and identified uh, nine non-outlier clusters amongst the nuclei, including two GABAergic uh, interneuron types and six layer five types and one layer six type. And these clusters were, were quite discrete, well separated from one another, and it, uh, were labeled by a number of clear marker genes shown in the violin plot here. Likewise, for the whole cells, uh, we found actually two additional clusters. One was a very similar subtype of, of a type identified in, in the nuclei, and another was a, a second layer six type that we actually didn't capture in the nuclear data. But overall, very similar uh, marker gene expression again showing the same exact genes um, ordered across these different clusters. So these, these clusters um, had markers associated with them, as I mentioned. Um, one cluster in particular was labeled by this cholinergic subunit, uh, CHRNA6. Um, and this labels by in situ hybridization a sparse number of cells in layer 5 of V1 and was identified both in the uh, whole cell data and in the nuclear data. And more broadly, um, the cell types are more, were more different from each other than the nuclear clusters were from the whole cell clusters. So this was encouraging that we were really capturing the broad diversity of types with both data sets. So um, now that we had sort of a method in hand to, to define these transcriptomic types, um, we applied this to the nuclear data from middle temporal gyrus of human cortex. As Rebecca mentioned, we have a data set of about 3,500 nuclei at the time of this analysis, but we'll be gathering many more nuclei. Um, these nuclei were isolated from all cortical layers and included a small subset of new and negative sorted nuclei uh, in order to prof profile both glial diversity and neuronal diversity in this region of cortex. Many clusters uh, uh, came out of the clustering analysis that were quite discrete from one another and included five glial types and 31 neuronal types, um, which you know, likely will find more diversity as, as we sampled more deeply. In particular, uh, there, was a, there were a broad diversity of upper layer neuronal types and perhaps more diversity than we're seeing in mouse, uh, which, which I think is intriguing given the evolutionary expansion of these upper layers from mouse to human. So uh, that, that was the clustering uh, clusters that we derived from this clustering procedure. Um, these are really just putative transcriptomic types. They need to be validated. So now Jenny will tell you about our approach to validate these and also place these types in a spatial context within the cortical circuit. Okay, so what I'm going to outline for you today are some of the goals that we have for this um, spatial transcriptomics project or multiplex fish project. Um, what we're using right now to look into validating some of the cell types that we found in using the human nuclei and some of the technical hurdles that we'll have to overcome to implement this and really get it up and running. <coughs> so as, as Trigba, and Jeremy, or Trigba and Rebecca told you, um, we have a lot of really good data to kind of parse out which cell types are present in specific areas of the human brain. And this has been done with nuclei. And so we have been able to identify specific genes that are important for discrete cell types. So if we had a way to fluorescently label each of these genes and then build a code for the expression pattern of these genes within discrete cell types, then we could put this data back in the spatial context and then call these cell types within the original 
cortical um, section that, that they were derived from. And this would be a really powerful way to tell us when we find a transcriptomic type, where is it and who, what it, might it be doing. So one test case that we've been using with our current um, setup is to look at a specific cell that's been shown to be um, specific to cetaceans and great apes and other really large animals, but not so prevalent in mice. So we thought this would be a really good opportunity to look at uh, a unique cell type. And so what we've been doing to um, characterize these is to use a technique called RNA scope, which is kind of out of the box and it allows us to <coughs> multiplex in a limited way and at least test some of the markers that, um, that Rebecca and Trigba have, have found in some of these cell types. So um, as you can see, there, what we're interested in is, is um, the specific gene expression patterns in cluster 44, which represent the von Economo neurons. And so what we're looking for is a combination of genes that are present or absent in these cells. We want to see that FESF2 is present or BCL11B and some of these other markers, but not some of these markers that should be present in other cell types in layer five. And so we can use RNA scope to look at three genes at a time and we can find some of the patterns that we're looking for in layer five. We hope to pair this with uh, morphological data to really nail it down. But you can see that this is, this is a good tool to, to validate spatially the cell types that we've discovered. However, we would like to multiplex this even further and get up to tens or hundreds of genes and that requires a little bit of um, methods development. So, one of the things that we have to decide on is our multiplexing method. And some, some labs have been solving this by doing sequential single molecule fish. And what you do with this approach, you have one floor for one probe per gene or several probes per gene, but one floor. And with each successive round of hybridization, you can visualize as many genes as you have floors. So in this case, if we have one floor. We can look at three genes over three rounds of hybridization. And in the end, you can multiplex up to the number of floors you have times the number of hybes you do. And this is very time and labor con um, consuming, but the pro is that it's extremely quantitative and gives you about as good a data as you would get from single cell RNA-seq or better, plus the spatial context. One of the cons is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of data storage space and a lot of computation to look at the data at the end of the day, so it may or may not be good to scale up. Um, Another thing you can do is to give each mRNA its own binary code. So either you, you, it's probed with a floor in round one of HYBE or it's not, like mRNA two, and in the next round the code changes and at the end you have a series of ones or zeros that tells you in this particular spot where you're visualizing the floor which mRNA was it. That's another approach that we could take. Yet another approach is to give each mRNA its own barcode. And this is usually done with fluorescence. <coughs> For instance, if you had three mRNAs, mRNA1 could be barcoded in red in the first round, mRNA2 in green in the first round, mRNA3 in purple, and then the code switches until at the end of all your hives, you have a different fluorescent barcode for each mRNA and you can tell how many of them are present in the tissue and where. So these are things that we're trying to de determine whether we'd like to use them or not. They all have their own pros and their own cons. I forgot to mention um, one issue that is specific to human tissue and that is lipofusin. So um, I, as you can see from, from this image, there are a number of cells that the fluorescence isn't really clear. It should be either red, blue, or green. There's a lot of autofluorescence in human tissue that has been attributed to something called lipofusin, which accumulates over time. And this is something that we've been working with um, Brian Long, who's part of the team working on this to eliminate. Um, I should mention that this is, a, this is a multidisciplinary effort and so we are working with Basilica Tasik and Took and um, Emma Guerin as well as Brian Long from the mouse team to uh, bring these types of techniques to bear for, for both projects, for both cell types projects. Another problem that we need to solve is something called object identification. A lot of the readout for these techniques comes in the form of fluorescent spots. And so we're going to need to develop some algorithms for calling both the floor and the location of the spots and then putting this data together um, to call cell types at the end of the day based on specific genes that are expressed in, in the context of the, of this, of the um, section. 
So as I mentioned, we have this goal to establish a multiplex fish method pipeline um, to analyze spatially some of the transcriptomic cell types that we've discovered. Um, currently, we can visualize gene expression with RNA scope up to about three floors, but this isn't going to be enough for our purposes, so we'd like to multiplex that even further going forward, and so we have this multidisciplinary effort to do that. Uh, we do have some imaging and analysis hurdles to overcome, including scaling up the imaging and quantification of transcript ex expression and getting rid of lipofusin. So um, that's what we'll be working on in the near future. And now I'll turn it over to Boaz, who will tell you about some of the human genetic tools that we're developing to help us study the brain. Thanks, Jenny. So as, uh, as Rebecca and Trigva told you, we're developing now a very detailed picture of cell types in the human cortex. And uh, we currently have 31 neuronal cell types. So how do we move towards a functional definition of cell types? Many of the tools that we're using at the Allen Institute to characterize cell types uh, are uh, retrospective in nature, such as single nuclear uh, transcriptional profiling, multiplex fish, and patch seek, which will be discussed in great detail in the next team talk. Uh, unfortunately, with these techniques, you only understand the uh, nature of the cell type after you've completed the experiment. And what we'd really like to be able to do is move towards uh, prospective techniques such as Cree driver mice, where a specific population of cells can be labeled in the cortex. However, since there's no germline transgenesis in humans, we can't use these types of lines. Uh, so what we would like to use instead are viral reporters where uh, specific transgenes can be driven in a subpopulation of cells in the cortex. And I'm showing here an example uh, that was recently published in Nature Neuroscience of a specific line that can label uh, interneurons in the cortex. And although there's a whole array of these transgenic reporters, uh, most of them haven't been tested in humans. And they certainly haven't been tested in uh, human slice cultures, which is the system that we're hoping to use to understand the functional uh, role of different cell types in the human cortex. And this work was really pioneered by Jonathan Ting and the Human Cell Types Group over the last several years at the Allen Institute. Uh, he's developed this uh, very nice system. We now have a regular supply of human cortical tissue from four local neurosurgeons. We have an existing pipeline to monitor tissue uh, histology, uh, cell type morphology, and electrophysiology. And one of the things that Jonathan has noted over the uh, course of the last couple of years is that the human slices can be maintained really for uh, multiple days and up to a week. Uh, and the neurons can retain uh, very good neuronal characteristics, which gives us an opportunity to study them. Uh, in addition, Jonathan has shown that uh, there are uh, fast viruses that we can infect neurons in these cultures, such as HSV, and we're now testing self-complementary AAV, which can infect the neurons in these slice cultures and uh, yield uh, gene expression uh, in the course of just several days. And this sort of opens up the uh, notion that we can take these tools and uh, begin to actually study uh, specific cell types uh, in, in the human cortex. So we have an array of viruses. Uh, you can use uh, uh, constitutive uh, promoters, and you can drive expression in all cell types in the brain. Uh, uh, we have uh, pan-class uh, viral tools that have been tested in mouse and in other species that we're now trying to test in this human culture system. And what we would really like to do is uh, begin to develop class-specific viral tools, uh, such as a somatostatin reporter where we can label all somatostatin inhibitory cell types. And eventually, what we, our goal is to be able to uh, label all of the cell types that we're identifying in mouse and humans uh, with uh, one or a combination of viral tools. Uh, and lastly, we would like to also generate viruses that can label uh, specific, uh, species-specific cell types, such as these von Economo neurons that seem to be uh, are much more represented in uh, humans and primates. So the way we're going about doing this, uh, first we want to identify and prioritize the cell types and classes that were, uh, that are, it's most essential to develop these tools for, such as uh, the classes of different interneurons where there are no good markers uh, that have been tested in humans for these cell types. 
And then what we want to do is apply all the, all the really powerful data that we're developing in-house, uh, such as the single cell transcriptomic characterization of mouse cortical cell types as well as the human cortical cell types. And what this can do is give us the marker genes, uh, the very best marker genes for every cell class and cell type. Uh, we've also developed attack seq data. Lucas Gray uh, has developed layer specific attack seq data. And I'm developing uh, human attack seq data that's based on layers. And uh, with this data, we can actually look for enhancers that are proximal to the best marker genes. And we're hoping to use these enhancers or cis regulatory modules uh, uh, to build in the specificity for expressing genes. And our first goal is to be able to identify orthologous cell types between mouse and human. And so we also want to look for conservation of the linear sequence uh, in these enhancers. So once we've identified the best possible enhancers for each, uh, each cell class, uh, we can test them by inserting them into a, into a virus upstream of a minimal promoter in an EGFP. And I am out of time. <laughs> but uh, so we, uh, we're going to uh, carry on. And uh, once we have these enhancers, we're going to go ahead and screen them. Uh, we want to do a pilot screen to see how good our selection is. So we want to see what our hit rate is. If our hit rate is high, then we can screen individually. And we'll be screening in the mouse cortex, because this is where we have tissue uh, all the time. And we can actually use one of these Cree driver lines to see if our, uh, our reporters are expressing in the target cell types. We can also apply a batch screening strategy. And once we have hits, we want to very carefully validate each of these enhancers uh, in both the mouse and the human cortex where we want to do immunocytochemistry, electrophysiology, and single nucleus RNA-seq, because we want to know exactly what are the cell types that are labeled by each enhancer virus. And in the end, what we hope to create here is a new suite of rapid onset viral tools that allow genetic access to specific cell classes and cell types in both mice and humans. And just to summarize the whole team talk, uh, what we've told you today, uh, we're using single nucleus RNA-seq to identify human neocortical cell types. And we show that we have similar resolution in cell type identification uh, that we get from whole cells. Uh, and then the data from uh, around 3,500 nuclei show 31 neuronal cell types and five non-neuronal cell types. And this is a rapidly growing data set. So it's going to be exciting to see where this goes. Uh, Jenny has showed you that we're beginning to use multiplex fish to validate uh, transcriptomic cell types as well as place them into a spatial context. And I've just showed you uh, our plans for building new uh, viral tools that allow marking and manipulation of transcriptomic cell classes and cell types. So with that, we'd like to thank all the people internally and externally who've been involved in the project. This is obviously the work of many, many people. And, uh, and I guess I'd last like to thank uh, uh, Paul and Jody Allen for their vision, encouragement, and support. So thank you. All right, so we have just a few minutes for questions. If you have a question, raise your hand, and someone will be by with a microphone. I get how you take the um, RNA information and then apply it to fish because you're trying to find the right markers. That, that's great. I don't understand. Does that RNA information feed into your work with the viruses, or is that a parallel independent effort? To yeah. I, from the transcriptomic information, we can identify what are the very best marker genes of every cell type or cell class. And then what we want to look for is enhancers or cis regulatory modules that are proximal to those genes. And we think that uh, by doing that, we, have, we bias our chances of finding very selective enhancers for that cell type. Hi. Yes? Up here. Have you thought of looking at the uh, FUGU, the pufferfish genome? It's a really compact genome. And the idea is that the enhancers are going to be easier to find, given that there's not uh, much space for I think there, there are some FUGU enhancers, and there are some that we've, we're thinking about testing out. Uh, but we're really hoping that by using the transcriptomic data from human, as well as uh, now that we actually have epigenetic data in human, we should be able to identify sort of the, the, the most direct enhancers near these genes. So 
Uh, we don't have current plans, but it's certainly something to look at. Yeah. 